Hello everyone, uh, welcome to this uh, web seminar. We are three delighted and grateful for your uh, participation today. Uh, we hope that will be helpful for this um, technique that is has been a challenge for us and for the world. Uh, thanks to these uh, new techniques and this uh, ultra thin wall needle, uh, it makes our life much easier. So today we are going to talk about pairs and trick of the flangeal sutureless fixation. Um, feel free to write down on the question and answer uh, panel any questions. So we will have a 20 minutes question and answer session at the end of the presentation. So we are waiting a little bit more in order to, because people are coming in. So we will be starting shortly in about two, three minutes. Thank you for your attention. So again, uh, we are more than happy to everyone to be engaged in this web seminar. You can write your questions anytime when you want. Uh, we will have a question and answer session at the end. Uh, we have been seeing that some questions are coming up. So please do it. We, are, we will be more than happy to answer any of those. So again, five minutes pass, has passed from the start. We are waiting one more minute in order to engage more people. People are coming into the channel as well. You can go to the YouTube um, of the TSK YouTube and you can see this live as well.
Okay. Uh, we're going to start now. Everyone is welcome. As we say, this uh, will be a very interactive um, web seminar. We want everyone to be engaged. We want to, uh, the three of us, uh, we want to thank the TSK for making our life much easier by these needles and also for support this web seminar. Thank you so much uh, for every single one at TSK who, TSK who made this dream come true. So today I will have the pleasure to talk about person trick of the flange IL sutureless fixation, but it would be much better because we are going to discuss one paper that we published and the brain of those papers, you can see it on the bottom, are Dina Sur and Katarina Bush. So without Dina and Katarina, this paper would not have been possible. As always say, it's every nice if you show things, but it's much better if you publish and you do the statistical analysis. So but having said that, let me start uh, by saying that we belong to the International Retina Group. Everyone from the group might uh, talk about this paper, but today is the three of us who are talking. Maybe next time uh, will be one of the 24 members around the world. As I said, let me introduce Dina Srur. She's from Tel Aviv Medical Center. She's a very well retina specialist physician. She writes awesome papers. And the paper, first paper we have together was in ophthalmology about biomarkers and DME. Of course, Katarina Bush is on the best uh, surgeon and doctor and statist statistician in Germany and in whole Europe. So we have the pleasure to have uh, Dina Sur and Katarina with us. This is a unique opportunity for everyone to share with, with Dina and Katarina uh, their knowledge. They are very well known around the world, but they are very, very smart. I am very happy to work very close to them. And of course, uh, let's say that uh, TSK uh, help us in order to perform this uh, web seminar, but also most importantly, to perform the surgery. They have a beautiful and uh, unique and very elegant uh, needles. And we are using nowadays for doing this um, technique, the 30 ultra thin wall, uh, which makes our surgery much better. And also it's much easier. And most importantly, uh, the better anatomical result that Dina and Katarina will show on the paper we publish about this technique with these needles. So these are our financial disclosures. And this is the paper uh, Dina, Dr. Sur and Dr. Bush will talk in details. So I'm going to face nowadays that um, without Professor Lowenstein, this paper and every single paper that you might see on PubMed, will not have been possible, we have the lucky uh, to have her support and we are thrilled again for her. So nowadays we have uh, several resources that we can to extract from inside the eye and select the best, in this case needle, in order to perform the Yamani technique. As you might know, the, the, this technique is the most common in the, in the world when you face this kind of patient. But let me start by the presentation by showing this. Everyone in, the, in this group, attendees, presenters, panelists, they want to perform the surgery and insert a multifocal intraocular lens like this one. Everyone is happy, patient is happy, but in diabetic patient, that, is not that, that condition is not that common. As you might see due to the details that they will tell us, we can face this kind of consequence, which is the lens inside the eye in this diabetic patient, or even more, uh, an intraocular lens, as you might see here, inside the eye. And we have to face this and do it properly. And the, is, the, easier, the easier the technique, uh, the better the result. This case of Marfan's, that there is no capsular support, and as well, we can use it. Today, we are going to focus on diabetic patients. 
but we can use it for every single one with no capsular support. Or in cases of diabetic patient with our friends from the anterior semen starter surgery, and everyone knows that the complications in diabetic patients are higher, and we start to perform the vitrectomy, get those uh, lens remaining to perform the vitrectomy, and also even more perform laser because of the traction the our friend from anterior examen did when they were trying to desperate uh, getting the cataract out from uh, the vitreous. Oh, in this case, there is uh, the hole because of the trauma. It is the whole intraocular lens and the capsular bag uh, inside the eye. Of course, we perform the vitrectomy. It's very important here to say that the vitrectomy is key in this technique in order to avoid complications. So Dr. Sur will talk about some complications and the complications, let me tell you one sneak peek that the complications are less with these needles. So, but in order to avoid retinal detachments, retinal tractions and retinal tears, we have to perform a vitrectomy. That is why we strongly recommend that the anterior segment team will work close, uh, very closely with, close uh, with the uh, vitrectomy uh, team. So as you might see, when the intraocular lens has started to spin, that means that there is no vitreous. And then as Dina will show later on, we have to take the lens out of the eye. But we have to, we have to, uh, should we should fix this. And in these complicated cases with some kind of um, silicon oil inside, you can see with this needle, it's very easy how to insert the intraocular lens. Once the haptic is inside the lumen of the needle, there is no way to come in out. And then we are pulling out carefully, but firmly at the same time, as you can see 27 gauge needle um, 27 gauge vitrectomy, 30C ultra thin wall needle. And the first question I saw on the Zoom was this, how big is the bottom? We will discuss that at the end of the, of the talk. The same thing we do with the second haptic. Uh, let me realize how easy, how easily the haptic goes inside the lumen of the ultra thin wall from TSK. I think nowadays we strongly believe that the, this needle is the best for ophthalmology. And thank you so much for TSK for thinking about ophthalmology as well. TSK is, is very well known for aesthetic and medicine in general, but now they are uh, focusing on ophthalmology luckily. So as you can see at the end in this complicated case, the intraocular is very well centered. You see a little bit of decentration, but it's because of the iris, not because of the uh, the lens. As a recommendation for this technique is check first if the haptic goes inside the needle, because when you are inside the eye, it's a little bit uh, difficult to, to do it. And it's a one, one step that we want to avoid. Just in case we, it doesn't happen with this needle that are pre-test, but it happened with 27 gauge needle. Uh, so as you might see, it's very easy to insert it. On my right hand, I have a mass weak forceps and on my left hand, I have the, the needle. You pull up a little bit and then that's it. You flange it and the bottom is created and it will remain there very well stable for at least 24 months as Dina and and Katarina will show. But if we compare with this technique that we, are, we have been using before, which is insert a 27 gauge uh, trocar and then take the optic from here, the wound is much higher and we stop using this, this technique because we have to make a bigger button on that optic in order to stay there. And we have been seeing a lot of this location. And you can see here how big is on the right and how small is on the left, because on the left we use the ultra thin wall needle and on the right, uh, we use 27 gauge needle, uh, sorry, 27 gauge needle. So this is what we have. Uh, this is how we ended up the surgery. So the following day, 
the, you might see uh, two bottoms, uh, blue dots. That means that the, the lens is very well in place. This is the first day, 12 hours after the surgery. You might see this, which is one button on the nasal part of the eye and on the temporal part of the eye. But this technique was published before us for sure. And they have been using and they have been shown the stability of this technique by Yamani and collaborators, but they switched to 27 now to 30 ultra thin walls. So we should use it, of course. But if you are asking us some tips, what we have to do, this is the, this is the highlight of the presentation. So a normal haptic has 150 microns. Yes, so 27 gauge needle, the normal gun, the normal one, make a 400 micron wound and it has 20, so 220 microns in a diameter. But if we go to the 30G normal, no ultra thin wall, it has only 140 uh, microns. That means that that doesn't fit. But on the other hand, thanks to, to TSK, we have the 30G ultra thin wall that makes a 300 microns wound. And this is very important as you might see later on in the presentation. And it has an inner diameter of 200 microns. So we have 500 microns that will fit properly there. And again, this is the highlight why we have to use 30G ultra thin wall for this technique and you might get much better results. Uh, why we use this? So um, we use this uh, from this brand. Uh, this box uh, was uh, bought in Europe. Uh, we kindly asked DSK to spread this kind of selling around the world. So in South America, if you wanna have it, you have to buy it in, ne in Netherlands, in Germany, or in Europe, or in Asia, in every single part, and then you bring it to Buenos Aires or wherever you are in South America, or in the, in the US as well, you have some representatives, but this will be increased and you will be, it will be easily reached, this. So again, I don't want to bother with the, same, with the same thing, but it's very easy to insert it. And this is the key, and when we are pulling out, there is no way to uh, slip away the, the haptic. So we are going to go a little bit farther and then as you might see this. So wrapping up the, the case, this is the case we performed uh, last week. So as you might see the whole technique, nowadays we mark uh, two millimeter from the limbus. I saw one question as well that was asking about this two millimeters two millimeters in this case of diabetic patient, as you might see, there is not good dilatation. The iris is compromised. And you might see this is a ultra thin wall needle. We bent it at 40 degrees angle. We inserted it. We created a tunnel. As you might see there, it should be a vented. And then we insert uh, the intraocular lens. And you can see at the first attempt how easily inserted the optic inside the lumen of the optic then we are going to go below the iris and then we pull carefully but firmly and you might see that there is no chance to retake and and to do anything there the it's amazing how the stable is when the optic is inside the lumen and you take it out you flange it when high temperature culture, and then you may create a small button and you can, you can see at the end how easily, uh, how well centered is. You don't see anything. Uh, you might see that that was a FACO, FACO without complications. So of course we finish with a vitrectomy and vitro fluid exchange because it was traction and it was complicated diabetic patients. So as you might see here, this is how it, and they're up. So let me go, just go straight to some results before. With this technique, there is no way if you do it well, any, the most important thing here, that it, it doesn't cause any antigmatism. You might see some aqueous lens and Gore-Tex suture that they have um, a lot of complications and this is because of the centration. But if we don't do well, if you don't use the, 
the perfect needle and the perfect intraocular lens. This is what might happen. Dina will talk in more details. I will show some dislocation, disintegration, and of course, some retinal detachment. So having said that, I will unshare my screen and Dr. Dina Schroer will share her screen right now. And she will enlighten us with everything. Please pay attention. Dina and Katarina are, are one of the smartest doctors in the world. And we have the pleasure to have it today for all of you. Thank you, Matthias, for this nice introduction. And thanks everybody for joining. We would like to do a short poll now, just to see where all the attendings are, are from in the world and also to get you a little more involved. And also please remember that you can, uh, while we are talking, um, ask questions in the Q&A and in the, in the end of the session, we would be more than happy to answer any questions. So um, if you could answer the question, where are you located at the moment? So you can vote now on the screen. <clears throat> Okay, so let's see. Let's see the results. Okay, so the majority is from Asia. We have America, Europe, and Oceania. Of course, we have some time zone differences, uh, which might uh, impact <laughs> um, how awake we are at the moment. And also we would like to ask you if you're doing um, sutralist IOL fixation in your daily clinical practice, and if you use the Yamana technique, um, if you have been using the Yamana technique so far. Um, and we hope that uh, those that didn't use it in the past or are using it already um, could get some more insights from our talk. And also, of course, share your experience with us so we can learn from you. So let's see the results. So it's uh, quite balanced. Half of you are using it. Um, and one more last question before we, we will present our paper. Uh, have you been using the 30 or ultrasound walled needle or the 27 gauge needle if you're doing or using the Yamana technique nowadays? or any other option that appears on the screen. Okay, so let's see. So I'm gonna wait a little bit longer, so let's give them uh, 30 seconds. Okay, so um, this paper uh, we're going to show you um, has been published in Acta Diabetologica lately. So if there are any more details you would like to, to learn about, you can always check it online uh, or contact us by email, of course. So the majority, 70% is using the 70, uh, 27 gauge um, and a quarter is using the 30 gauge and 4% ultra 31. So maybe we will um, um, give you some more information from uh, our experience. So let's go straight to the paper, as I said, um, this has been published um, in Acta Diabetologica um, just recently. Uh, as uh, Matthias already showed the problem, the secondary IOL implantation in the absence of capsular support is, um, is challenging. Of course, we do have several surgical options available, which can be the anterior chamber IOL, which is the easy ones, easiest one to um, uh, implant. We can use iris claw lenses or suture to the iris, or of course, suture to the sclera. However, all of those bear some um, complications or limitations, um, such as um, the development of damage to the corneal endothelium. Um, we see patients ending up with corneal transplants, glaucoma because uh, patients develop uh, anterior synesthesia stress to the iris because of the claw or because of the suturing, and of course also late dislocation into the vitreous cavity. Um, the sutures can cause erosions and the haptics can break, as I will show you um, soon. So this is a, a very some example where you have um, erosion and um, the haptics out of the eye. Of course, we need to uh, pull them out and uh, also 
do a vitrectomy because the, the optic fell down to the vitreous cavity. You can see as we raise it. Um, and then extract the intraocular lens. You have to enlarge the, um, the incision. And of course, we don't want to see late complications such as uh, late retinal detachment because of the traction we caused um, during the primary surgery. And also we don't want to see late uh, IOL sublocations or dislocations uh, where we need to enter the eye for an, uh, another time. And this is why Yaman and colleagues um, developed the Yamane technique, which was published first in 2014 in ophthalmology, where they knew, used the two needle intraskeral haptic fixation using a 27 gauge needle. Um, the haptics were um, sutureless fixated into the sclera, as Matthias showed you before the surgeries. And they showed that the IOL could be fixated with re reliable bound closure without using any sutures. However, they showed that in the long term, there was a, a potential risk of IOL dislocation, mainly because the haptic insertion into the sclera tunnel was not um, well um, fixed over time. And this is why in 2017, they entered the new surgical tour for a transconjunctival intraskleral fixation where they used a 30 gauge thin wall needle. Wall needle. Um, as you can show here um, in the imaging and the UVM picture, that's a very nice example showing that um, the haptic and the flanged um, end are located, located just inside the sclera with a nice sclera and episclera and conjunctiva be, uh, above it, uh, ensuring uh, the fixation. But we have been asking ourselves what happens in diabetic patients, which is a population that has more cataract uh, complications, intraoperative and postoperative. And uh, why are we asking this question? Because it's known, it has been published before, that the sclera stiffness in diabetic patients is alterated and they have uh, some um, difference from non-diabetic patients in terms of collagen fiber alignment. And this is why we asked if it is safe to use an intrascleral fixation technique in diabetic patients. So the aims of our study were to analyze the role of a secondary sutureless scleral IOL fixation in diabetic patients without capsular support, of course, and then to compare the anatomical and functional outcomes of this secondary scleral IOL implantation using a 30 gauge ultra-thin ultra -thin wall needle versus a 27 gauge needle. And I would like to, Dr. Bush to take it from here and show you the methodology and our um, results. So Kata, you can. Yeah, hello everyone. Let's just share, let me share my screen. Is it working? Yeah. Um, so what we basically have done in our studies that we conducted a retrospective cohort study. Um, I just go quickly with you through the methods and um, the inclusion exclusion criteria. So we actually just simply uh, included adult type 2 diabetes patients that were a fake kick due to a um, complicated FACO without capsular support. And all of those uh, patients underwent a retractomy with a sutureless IOL flange technique. And um, we ended up having two different groups. So in the beginning of the um, study period, most of the people were um, uh, treated or, or operated with a seven the uh, uh, 27 gauge needle and um, later on most of the um, patients were um, so, uh, operated with a 33 ultra thin wall needle and we only included patients that had a two years follow-up because we were mainly interested in uh, the long-term outcome the long-term stability we excluded patients with pdr and with dme because this might uh, impact the visual outcome and we also excluded patients with any other previous surgery um, except the FECO. Um, and also, of course, patients that had any condition that might impact the scleral or collagen structure like Marfan's disease and patients with unusual um, short or um, very high lens, uh, actual lens. Um, so we did a 
Pad review, of course, for all those um, demographic data and excellence and visual acuity, IOP and refraction at baseline and doing the study period. I think this is not very surprisingly. Um, and also, we were quite interested in the intra and post-operative complications. We have seen very nicely before uh, from Dina and Matthias what kind of complications are um, to be expected. Um, the primary outcome has been, of course, IOL stability and transitivity during the study period. If there is any difference between uh, 27 and 30 gauge ultra thin wall needle, and a secondary outcome have been the intra and post operative complication and the comparison between both groups. So, what we mainly were interested in is there any benefit from using the um, thinner, uh, thinner needle that might it really makes a difference. And I think this is one of the reasons most of the people are watching today, because I, if I, if we, as we have seen, um, most of the people uh, still use the 27 gauge. So we have been able to include 105 um, eyes from 105 patients. Um, both groups were equal, equally disputed mean age and uh, also gender and time onto surgery, all those baseline characteristics you can see here have not been different between both groups. Also not excellence and IUP. So both groups were well um, balanced in terms of um, baseline characteristics. Those shots shows, you know, the um, visual outcome over the study periods, study period um, in the seven, in the 27 uh, gauge group you see that there was quite a quite a stable visual acuity. It got a little bit worse. Um, and in this 33 gauge um, ultra thin wall needle, the visual acuity got a lot of a lot better. And in the end, it was or uh, almost quite shortly after surgery, it was significantly better in this 30 gauge ultra thin wall. Rena, um, sorry for interrupting, but I think we're still saying the same slide. So maybe you can. Go into full screen. Uh, I am on full screen. What slide do you see now? Could you, sorry for, for this uh, small technical issue, could you maybe stop screen sharing and then share again? Okay. And then choose the full screen when you. I'm on full screen. Yeah, it's perfect. Thank you. I'm sorry. It's okay. So um, I don't know what kind of slides you've seen before. Uh, so I'm on the results slide now, showing that the visual acuity outcome was much better in the 33 gauge group, um, even shortly after surgery, and it um, stayed much better during the study period. In this 27 gauge group, as you see here, it uh, slightly worsened over the study period. But the, the main interest was. However, um, no, no. Ah, the main interest uh, in of our study was the uh, stability of the IOL. Um, this table shows you the spherical equival equivalent and how it has changed over the study period. It was quite stable again in the 33 gauge group, and again uh, it was it got a little bit worse in the 27 gauge group. So again, here was a benefit seen in the 33 gauge ultrasound wall group. And it was much more stable in this group. When it came to astigmatism, it, it um, appeared that, especially in the later course of the study period in the 27 gauge group, um, the astigmatism increased a lot. It became significantly um, statistically significant and uh, worse in this 27 gauge group. So it appears that the IL was not that stable compared to the 30 gauge ultra thin wall needle group. Again, here was a great benefit seen in the uh, group that has been treated with the ultra thin wall needle. Last but not least, of course, it's always. In, uh, important to know about complications. This table shows you now the complications we have been observed that we have observed in both groups. Um, 
As you might see from the first slide, um, almost all of the complications has occurred in the 27 gauge group, and that was very interesting. So um, the only the only um, complication that has been seen in only one patient of this 33 gauge group was a iris um, bleeding. So this is for me. So this just slide shows very nicely the benefit of the 33 gauge group. It's not only that it's more stable and the IRL is more stable and you have for that reason a better outcome long-termly, but also you have to face less complications. And with that, I would like to hand over to my colleague, Dina again. So um, Dina is starting sharing, perfect. Okay, thank you, Kata. Um, so um, I think the study mainly showed um, when comparing the IOL fixation using a 27 gauge or 30 gauge ultrasound wall needle in the diabetic population, that using the 30 gauge needle, we had a, a statistically significant less IOL decentration and dislocation, as uh, Dr. Bush just showed to you, as well as intra and less postoperative complications. And this is a very nice example of a UBM, which I strongly recommend you to use this tool in uh, the setting of um, a missing capsular support, also preoperatively and also postoperatively, or in cases where do you have um, recurrent bleeding and so on. Um, because you can very nicely see also the um, location and centration of the IOL in the posterior chamber, but also look at the, uh, the haptics, see if there's any connection or any uh, shafting of the uh, posterior iris or the ciliary body. So I use it a lot and I think it's very valuable in this, um, in this setting. But going back to the study, um, as you uh, probably know, the sclera is mainly... Um, structured from 90% collagen type 1 and less than 5% collagen type 3, which is embedded in a hydrated matrix of proteoglycans. And as I mentioned at the beginning, in diabetic population, uh, the diabetes impacts not only the microvascular, um, uh, the microvascular capillaries, but also the scleral stiffness and architecture, which is mainly caused by an altered interaction between those collagen fibers and the properties of the matrix. And this is from another study which has been published in 2015, where you see the differences in the um, scleral structure and stiffness in diabetic and non-diabetic patients. So as you saw, using the 27 gauge needle technique, um, this might mo more severely impact the scleral structure in our cohort and cause some disorganization. And we hypothesized that this is why the IOL haptics were less stable. And also we had this higher rate of decentration dislocation. On the other hand, using the 30 gauge ultra thin wall needle, we had a lower rate of IOL disintegration and displacement and also better land stability along the study period. And we again hypothesized that this is because there was, this is a less traumatic procedure uh, in these patients who already have an impaired wound repair, of course, all, everywhere in the body, but also in the sclera. And because this is a less traumatic procedure, we think that this is more likely that the scleral wound will close properly and allow haptic stability um, along the way after the, um, after the surgery. And of course, there are several limitations to the study. It is a retrospective uh, study. We could not randomize between the two groups uh, as it was uh, a relatively uh, small cohort. And also we did not perform routine anterior segment imaging to check for the IOL position, but we did it in some patients. And this is why we could show you um, these examples here, which add a lot of information. And also we did not have data about the systemic diabetic control and the severity of the diabetic retinopathy, which might uh, confound the results. And this is of course why we need a randomized controlled trial in order to compare between diabetics and non-diabetics and also between the diabetics according to the uh, um, diabetes severity, the systemic control and also other ocular complications in order to realize the role of this technique as a solution for a patient. 
Um, but summing up, we found that sutureous IOL flange technique using a 30 gauge ultra thin wall needle is more predictable. And we found that there were less complications in aphagic diabetic patients compared to the use of the 27 gauge needle technique. In the name of the International Retina Group, we would all three like to thank you very much for your attention. And of course, for TSK for making this web seminar uh, possible. And now we would uh, be more than happy to take your questions and answer those now. Excellent. So, so Dina, there are several questions that are coming up. While they are coming up, uh, would you like me to read it? Or would you like to do I it? think I will, I will um, maybe I start asking you one of the questions okay. you already um, mentioned while uh, presenting, but uh, there's one question. How do you estimate the size of flange bulb? That's a very nice question. And uh, that's a very nice question. And what we have to do is just press the, press the, the high temperature criteria just one second. By one second is more than enough uh, to melt the bottom in 30G ultra thin wall. If you use it 27, you have to press it for three seconds. That's mean that you have more, uh, more uh, material to melt. So with what second you have um, half millimeter uh, bottom and that will remain there for, for a long, long time, at least as you might mention, uh, 24 months follow up, we have better results. Yeah, so um, let's continue with the questions. Mm -hmm. uh, the second question we already have answered, it was uh, asked how far the, from the limbus do you enter the eye, it was two millimeters. Um, so is there anything you would like to add on that question? Maybe you yes. can do it, Kata, no? No. Okay. I think there's not, not, not much more to, to add than saying it's two okay. millimeters. But so... there is another question on that, wait. Mm -hmm. wait. There's another question that is quite um, similar and that is something I would like to, you to answer. Do you travel two millimeters via your scleral tunnel before diving into the vitreous cavity doing needle insertion? Yes, uh, that's correct. As, uh, as we shown, uh, so what we do, we mark uh, our tree and our nine with the intraocular lens toric marker. And then from there, two millimeters to nasally and temporally and then two millimeters inferiorly and superiorly. Then you make the tunnel and the way to make uh, the tunnel much visible is to bend the needle a little bit like this. If you see that the scleral is depressing, like as when we do a scleral depression, that means that the, 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 the channel is very well created and you will be very sure uh, as we have seen on the UVM that Dina showed that the uh, haptic is, is it is inside uh, the the sclera where it should be. So again, summing up, how far the limbus is two millimeters uh, on the nasal side, and then inferiorly two millimeters, and then on the temporal eye two millimeters, and then uh, superiorly or inferiorly depends how you like it, uh, two millimeters as well, and you will get a perfect centration and perfect um, intraocular lens power. And I think the following question, it's related with IOL, IOL power, right? Yes, I think that's a very important question. So um, there's a question if you change your IOL power when you uh, do the Yamana technique. Well, the answer is uh, we don't. So it's even easier. So it happened during the surgery, it's much better. Uh, so, uh, for instance, uh, one friend from the anterior chamber is uh, performing a cataract surgery in diabetic patient and then something coming up and the posterior capsule is broken and then you don't have to switch uh, any or do any statistical analysis or recalculate the intraocular lens. So you do it in a way that you put it in the bag. So that's the benefit of this um, technique. So there is no way to change it. I can see here that Christopher Taper from Bern is having a good time for us. Christopher Taper is a very good uh, friend of all of us. And he's saying that this uh, presentation was outstanding. Thank you so much, Christopher from Bern, uh, Switzerland. 
So Matthias, I think there's one very important question um, regarding patients that have high myopia. Um, or patients that have a short axial length. Of course, we excluded this for this pilot study, but in, in daily practice, do you have any special considerations you want to share with us? Um, well, the, only the considerations is not about the technique, it's not about the technique, but it is about the retinal complications. As everyone knows that uh, myopic patients trying to uh, get more uh, retinal detachment complications, and of course, last but not least, uh, the centration because of the axial length. So uh, if the retina is okay, I don't see any uh, retinal tears or peripheral lesion or lattice um, that think that we have to treat before performing the surgery. Uh, I'm not worried about the scleral thickness or about the, any of those because it works very well. And it's only 30 hundred microns if we use 30 T ultra thin wall if maybe TSK can make for us, and they are going to do it, I think, 31 or 32 gauge with at least 150 microns inside, that will be even uh, better and less worry about any uh, perforation if you don't do it perfectly. But having said that, there is no concern. Great. There's so one. the next, sorry, <laughs> the next go. question was, um, and this is a very interesting question, I think. Um, patient with history of multiple injections of those patients might have a higher risk for endophthalmitis after Yemeni, Yemeni technique. Um, and um, if they will have higher risk uh, for the future, for future interdental injections. So I would like to. Um, yeah, yeah go ahead. The, the, Dina is the, uh, having working on multiple multiple uh, injection and what happened in the sclera. So she's the best to answer Correct. this question. So we have been doing a. It's not published yet, but we really hope for to see it uh, online soon. And we have been looking prospectively at patients who have had multiple intravitreal injections and um, checking the anterior sclera using uh, ultrasound microscopy. And also the group of, from Bern has been publishing a paper using anterior segment OCT. And they did find some thinning of the anterior sclera when you look at patients that had more than 30 injections. However, when we, sh when we switch and alternate the injection um, quadrant, even in patients that had lots of intravitreal injections, we didn't find any, um, any scleral thinning or uh, other structural changes. So extrapolating from this data, I think um, we can say that it's safe. We did not have any cases of endophthalmitis in, in our paper uh, in this cohort we showed to you just now. Yeah. So the question is actually, but I think that's... Um, Something interesting, but you just answered it. So the, if you're using Yemenic technique and you have to do a lot of injections later, it might, it still appears to be safe in terms of IOL stability because you might not affect the scleral, sclera too much if you change the quadrant. Um, and we have not observed any endophthalmitis in our cohort. That's so we conclude that it did not increase the risk, but we have to be honest, it's quite a small cohort, so we might not be able to properly answer this and the future will show us when we use the technique more often and have bigger cohorts. Um, the last question of that participant, I would like to um, direct to Matthias. So what intraoperative or postoperative antibiotics do you recommend for this procedure? Yeah, so it has not been proven, but we what we usually do is, of course, uh, swap povidan or any kind of the other povidan at 5%, that's mandatory. Um, and then what we use before, three days before, is gatifloxacin 0.5%, and then one week after, three times per day, uh, again, gatifloxacin 0.5% as well. And then we use topical steroids, and with that you are more than covered. Even it has not been proven, the only thing that it's what that it was proven was probably done, um, yeah, inside the the eye uh, five minutes before performing the surgery. So there are some more interesting questions. Um, Yashin is asking which three piece IOL would you recommend? 
I think this is one of the best questions we have been uh, facing because at the beginning we have been using uh, different kind of uh, lenses with different kind of optic material, uh, PMMA or any kind of different. So the best material and the, the only one material we use is the one that is made in France and it, its optics are made by Kynar. As you show on the video, you can bend, you can uh, folder, you can do whatever you want with those haptics. And then they have a lot of memory. And at the end of the surgery, it won't break. It won't be dislocated. It won't be disintrated. So uh, we strongly recommend one brand, if you have any questions, which one uh, type Kynar, K-E-N-I. A Y, I R, and then you might see that it's from France, and that's the only uh, intraocular lens that is proven to work properly. So we started with the uh, the biggest uh, brand in ophthalmology, Surgical, which is the biggest machine. I don't want to go into any brands, but think the biggest uh, vitrectomy machine in the US and it, the, the, there were a lot of problems because the haptic uh, broke several times, there was disintered, dislocated. So the only one is the one that is made the haptic by Kynar. Kynar, that's the, that's the way. If you have any question or concern, please uh, download our paper and we will be more than happy to send you the brand. And speaking uh, speaking of recommendations, uh, there was another question. If you, if it does matter, what kind of cartery do you device do you use, or is there anything the people should take care of when they decide what kind of cartery device they use? Yes, there are two things that uh, you might use. You can use uh, cryo in order to melt those, or you can use high temperature. So high temperature are very single use are very nice. Uh, you have to be very careful that there are no gases or liquid uh, inside the OR because sometimes uh, it has been reported when you press uh, the high temperature cauterio, you can burn a little bit um, the strip or some eye lips or the eye lip if there is gas, some liquid in the OR. So having said that, if everything is okay, so you only, with the 30 g ultra thin wall, you only press uh, one second the high temperature criteria and that's it. So that's why the less exposure to the criteria, the less problem you will face, uh, not only for the patient, but also for the surgical team. And another in interesting question is, uh, do you always have to do a pass plan of vitrectomy or is it acceptable to do an anterior vitrectomy? Uh, Jonathan is asking. Well, that's a very interesting question as uh, we are writing assertions and we are writing a specialist. So we will strongly recommend uh, perform a complete retinal uh, vitrectomy. Do not forget that we are talking here in diabetic patients and we only do a core vitrectomy. We might get some traction. We might get some retinal detachment in this patient. If you're talking about no diabetic patients, again, you have to be very sure that there is no traction you have to use the scleral depression in order to check the periphery and check that while doing the surgery and why the surgery was complicated, there were no tears. But you might realize that more than 40% of the complicated cataract surgery developed um, a tear because of the traction during the surgery and that was published. So uh, we can be biased because we are retina specialists, but we, we really want to perform a full vitrectomy, a complete vitrectomy in these uh, cases of uh, sutureless intraocular flange technique. So to sum it up, we actually recommend to do full vitrectomy in all cases because you never know what, that there's always kind of traction afterwards and that might lead to tears and retinal detachment. And there's another question that I, I might answer just um, by, by 
asking it, is it uh, two millimeters apparent from limbus or sclerospur? So when we look at the UBM, we used to measure it from the sclerospur because this is a landmark when you use the UBM. However, clinically, we, we use the limbus as a, as a landmark. Yeah. So Matthias, do you have, since you're the, the, the expert in this technique, have you ever performed this technique in a muffin? Uh, a patient, a patient with Marfan yeah. syndrome, and what yes. what have been your ex experience? Yeah, so um, yes, I shown uh, as we shown because it's our presentation uh, one Marfan's uh, syndrome. So what we do is we take the lens out. We have to be a little bit careful uh, because of the sclera is thinner, but then there is no. If you do it perfectly, if you just see the the, the, the small, the ultra thin wall needle going through the sclera and you created a tunnel, it works perfectly. The, I, I, I've been, we have been doing more than 50 patients of Marfan's disease in these five years. And there was no complication if we perform a vitrectomy. Of course, these patients are myopic by itself. The axial lens is much higher than the average. And if you do it, uh, properly, there is no way to get any complication uh, because of the technique, at least. I think we have two, uh, some more minutes for the last two questions. One was, how is the stability of the IOL with head shaking? Pedro is answering, is asking, sorry. Matthias, you want to answer? So what do you mean hand shaking? I mean, during head the shaking. surgery of, yeah, but head, head shaking. shaking. I think After? afterwards. I think he's, I'm, I'm uh, answering uh, for him, but when we check patients post-operatively and how do you, if there's any donases when you look at them. Uh, oh, okay, that's, that's a nice question. So, uh, so once when we have been using the first time when the, the residents were trying to perform this surgery. So once one of the haptic, the second haptic, uh, the first haptic was perfectly done. This is a long short story that will answer that perfectly. So the second haptic, the, the trading haptic, um, was cut, yes, the second one. So the first one went perfectly done. So if you, we, he tried to pull the optic in order to take out the lens, there's no way when the button is created that you can pull the lens again through into the eye. You have to take out the lens outside the eye. So if you put it perfectly and you put the, uh, the buttons inside the sclera, there is no way to move, even the patient is going down, going up, uh, going uh, skiing, doing whatever uh, he or she wants. Uh, the stability is absolutely amazing. So maybe I can ask an, a last question. Yes. Since uh, we're running out of time, we have seen that a lot of people, almost half of the people attending today, uh, using 27 gauge stuff. So, um, and we have seen in our cohort that there's a high risk of instability um, and even dislocation. So how you treat those patients, maybe you can just go on on that a little bit. And uh, if the, is there any problems with doing a second uh, Yamani, Yamani technique in those eyes? So uh, your question was, Kata, let me think if I understood correctly. So if there is any problem with one Yamani technique, the first one, um, for instance, the drop, the lens dropped. If you can retake it, mm -hmm. that's what you're saying. And if you well, do Yamani just again, uh, you can use it. You can do it, but only if you use this lens because you have to cut. You have to cut the tip of the haptic in order to melt it again. Otherwise, it won't fit inside the inside the needle. So with this lens that has very long haptics and you can play with that and you have a very, very large margin to play. So you can do it. You cut the tip of the uh, intraocular lens and then you put it again and you melt it again. So you can do it one or two times. So the, the answer is yes, but only if we, if we use the proper uh, tools, which is the ultra thin gold and this beautiful French IOL. And will you, will you switch the Clairo and search side a little bit around? You, you won't use the same Clairo side again, or it doesn't make any difference? Yeah, yeah, you won't see it. So after 
so if, if the pain of the time, and this is a very nice question for our, our father paper, but, uh, what happened with those patients that uh, we have to take the lens out? I, I can't come up with any of those and we can per perform UVM and what happened with that uh, scleral wound. Uh, I, 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 I'm not say, I cannot say that perfectly, but uh, Dina, who is an expert on UVM, what would you expect, Dina? Very nice question, Kata. I'm sorry I cannot answer properly. No, it's okay. We're just they're discussing, right? Yeah. So maybe we in should our... look it up in the next paper. Yeah, that's a very nice question. So uh, the question is if uh, there is a wound after maybe one month, two months, or just is um, there is a scar or just is there is nothing that you can see even if you perform a UVM. That's a very nice question. But for sure, if the lens dropped, uh, you should have done something wrong because it's very hard, hard to uh, go down to the vitreous cavity when you melt it properly. It's almost impossible. As I said, when you pull one, the haptic, and one is already melted, there is, in, there is no way to take it out from inside the eye. You have to take it from outside the eye and cut the haptic, which is very close to the optic. So it's very stable, very strong, uh, the only way it might happen if you don't use the proper lens is the only the optics go down because you have been playing around with the haptics a lot during the surgery and those are not kinar material and that could be this this and yeah dislocated from the optic and you will end it up as Dina show on the video the optic the optic ended up inside the vitreous cavity. Okay, so I think uh, our time is over. Um, we enjoyed it very much, and I ho we hope you did so as well. Uh, if you have any more questions, you're welcome to contact us by email, or um, we'll be more than happy to answer. So thank you, Matthias, Katarina. Thank you, TSK, for allowing us to uh, perform this web seminar today with you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Have a lovely day. Bye-bye.